The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, thank you very much for coming to my talk. My name is Ken Moore, part of the PG PCBSD project, and I'm just going to present to you getting started with PCB, a basic introduction for how to install and run it and what some of the unique applications are within the PCBSD desktop environment. All right. So first off, PCBSD is based upon an operating system entitled FreeBSD. So at Linux conferences like this, we always get the question, well, what is FreeBSD? So here's just a couple you know, key points. The good, it's a Unix-like operating system descended from AT&T Unix. Legal re for legal reasons, it can't be called Unix specifically. Instead, they have adopted the moniker BSD, or Berkeley Software Distribution. All right, it has legendary stability and security. People will run BSDs from, you know, six or seven years ago, they'll never upgrade off of like the version four, even though we're already past version nine, and it still runs and still works great for running web servers and stuff. It's a very secure, very stable operating system. It has what is called the port system. This is a collection of over, over 23,000 at the current moment, instructions for building applications from source. And these can be any applications. Most of them are the same open source applications that you know and love in the Linux community. Pretty much any open source application with GPL license, BSD license, you know, whatever you've got. So you have your um, Mozilla Firefoxes, you have your Apaches, you have your NGINX servers. You got, you know, pretty much everything that you expect to have. A unified development model. Its development structure is a bit different from Linux in that it's designed and run more like a business. You have a central team, a central core team that's elected every few years, and they're the ones that make the decisions about, okay, this is the direction that we're going to go, this is what we're gonna pursue, we'll hire developers to do this and this on it, but then they also accept all the donations from other developers who say, hey, I want it to do this, I'm gonna write it and say, here it is, and they'll say, okay, now we'll go ahead and put it in and implement it. So just for that reason, that's one of the reasons it's so stable and secure is they try to make sure from that format that everything that's done and added to the operating system keeps backwards compatibility with everything else that has previously run. They try to make sure not to constantly break formats as they proceed. Uh, it has excellent documentation. FreeBSD is known for having their handbook. If you go online, it's a massive handbook for covering pretty much everything related to FreeBSD. So if you have a question and you go on the mailing list or the forums, people will say, oh, well, did you read the handbook page on whatever it is that you're having an issue with? There's excellent documentation sources for FreeBSD. And then lastly, it actually has the BSD license. For those of you that don't know what the BSD license is, I'll show it to you here in just a moment. But let me talk about the bad for a moment. One, it is command line only. This is good for server applications, but for graphical applications where you actually wanna have a desktop environment, it makes it kind of difficult because it's, it's not designed for that. It's more of designed just for command line servers. And then it's also, because it was designed more for command line servers, it's lacking some of the more uh, PC-oriented device drivers and stuff, like graphics drivers, ATI drivers particularly. While they're getting a lot better on this, they're still missing some support for a lot of the ATI drivers. They just recently added the Intel graphics driver sets, and those work pretty well. There still might be a few mugs because they're pretty new, but the NVIDIA graphics drivers are excellent. We actually have great uh, binary blobs from the NVIDIA people themselves, specifically created for FreeBSD. So we always recommend NVIDIA graphics drivers if you're gonna get started with FreeBSD just because they have the absolutely the best support. ATI, it's getting there. <laughs> okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the BSD license a little bit. So here is the BSD license. This is the official BSD license, the three clause BSD license. And basically, as you can read, it's just three little clauses. First one says you have to include our copyright in anything that you use that uses the software. If you're gonna develop off of it, just you know, make sure to keep our copyright in there. Second one, or sorry, second one is re reproduce the copyright. No, both of them. Basically, reproduce the copyright in there, don't sue us if it breaks, and then the third clause is usually you can't use the name of the application without the user's consent, without the author's consent. Um, in more recent days, it, this has actually been shrunk down to just two clauses. They've removed the um, 
redistribution of involving the name and the, of the organization and stuff. They've kind of removed that clause and said, we don't need that. We'll just restrict it to two clause. So include our copyright and don't sue us if it breaks. That's pretty much it. Nice and easy for the BSD license. For the GPL license, that's the standard Linux license that a lot of you are familiar with. This is for comparison, the GPL license in the same font, GPL version three, and it goes over many, 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 many pages. And I can't even tell you everything that's in it because I'm not a trained lawyer. All I know is that it kind of has stuff that says you can't do this, you should do this, and then I believe there are some things in it that says you must do this if you're developing off of it. From a user perspective, I don't think it does that, but again, I'm not a lawyer, don't take my word for it. You're probably gonna wanna go hire somebody to read through it and make sure you're compliant with, with it. BSD license is much simpler, so the free BSD always tries to push the BSD license whenever possible, and PCBSD takes this approach as well, licensed under the BSD license. All right. So what is PCBSD then? We've covered a little bit of what FreeBSD is. PCBSD takes FreeBSD and tries to make it simple. It tries to take all the hardship and pain out of configuration out of the way and make it simple to use, specifically for desktop environments and workstations. So as I have here, it is a pre-configured desktop or server installation. I'm not gonna go into the server side aspect of that. We, call, we refer to that as true OS. That is the PCBSD server. And then the desktop environment. It is also desktop environment agnostic. We do not care if you run KDE or GNOME or LXDE or XFCE or a host of the other unsupported, what we classify as unsupported or advanced window managers that are available. You know, take your pick. It doesn't really matter to us. The PCBSD additions will run desktop independent. It should run on all of them, all right? So what are some of these additions that the PCBSD project brings to the table? One, they have a graphical installer. This is quite different from the FreeBSD installer, which again is text-based and gives you very, very basic install instructions. But if you want to install things such as the ZFS file system, which is one of FreeBSD's great strengths, Using the FreeBSD installer, you would have to just go to the command line, look up a handbook, and spend an hour or more trying to figure out what the proper commands are to manually create your ZFS pools. With PCBSD, there's a graphical installer, makes it very simple to get through it, and it will automatically set up ZFS file system for you, as well as all the other options. And we'll go through the installer in more details here in a little bit. But this is one of the enhancements that PCBSD brings to the table, is simplifying the installation process to a very, very simple. All right, second one is Warden. Uh, FreeBSD has a system called Jails that basically lets you run very, very low footprint virtualized environments on FreeBSD systems. We're talking easily running thousands of these at a time rather than tens for other virtual environments. So the Warden is a utility that was created specifically for managing and setting this up. Again, so that you don't have to go look through tons of documentation and handbooks trying to figure out what the proper commands are to set up a single jail. It'll let you set up and do tons of them very easily and manage all of them and install packages into them, et cetera. All right, PBI package format, I'll go into this later. PCBSD has also added an additional package format in addition to the ones offered by FreeBSD. This is more of a standard executable, a single file that you can just download and install and run and it keeps it separate from everything. And as I said, I'll go into more detail about that later. Easy PBI, a graphical application for producing your own PBI packages in case our repository doesn't happen and to have the one, that, the one particular application you're, look, you're looking for. Excuse me. System meta packages, a nice safe way of changing around your system configuration. So for instance, a meta package for the KDE desktop, a system package for the GNOME desktop. You don't have to worry about getting all the individual pieces yourself. You can just say, oh, I want that one and it'll grab the whole thing for you and install it so that you have compatible versions of everything. And then there's a many other graphical system administration things for things like such as networking and wireless connections and stuff like that that's specific to FreeBSD. All right, now let's go through the installer for PCBSD. So this is the first screen that you would appear when you load up the disk in the installer. If you hit the button in the bottom left corner, it brings up a nice hardware compatibility wizard. It will actually check your hardware and tell you what will and what won't work. This is on my desktop system where I took a screenshot and you'll tell I don't have a Wi-Fi card in my system. So that's not gonna bother me that it says there's no Wi-Fi. Not a problem, but as you can see, all the rest of those work. I have video drivers, 
I have a proper video resolution, which is the right one for my monitor. It's a 1600 by 9900. I have an Ethernet device, and I have a sound device. So I'm going to be perfectly fine before I even do the installation of PCBSD. I know ahead of time it'll all work fine. If there are any issues here, it might mean that just some additional configuration will be needed after the, after the installation of PCBSD in order to get that device working properly. All right, here's the next screen on the PCBSD install installer. This is where you select what you actually want to install. So on the top screen, these are just kind of the options. On the top screen, you can see the different desktop environments we have available, LXDE, GNOME, and XFCE. And then on this one, I tried to show them all. You got KDE, TrueOS, which is the server option, and then plain FreeBSD on the left as well. So these are just where you can pick. These are the easy selections. Just say, oh, I want that one, and then click Next. Or if you want more control, you can actually click the Customize button and say, I want XFCE and GNOME. Or you can you know, start adding and making your own system and adding, putting all of them in there if you want. The next screen, the disk selection. This is, by default, PCBSD wants to use the entire disk that you give to it. So I highly recommend hitting the Customize button if you are going to install it to a single partition, otherwise you'll blow away your entire computer, all right? So this is a warning. Always check, because it says right there, the entire partition, and it says all, so that's using the entire disk, okay? That's just the default for this, so always hit the Customize button. So let's go into the Customize button and see what's there really quick. First one, there are three different modes, basic, advanced, and then what's called FreeBSD experts. Basically, it drops you to a command line and says, okay, if you're an expert, you should already know the commands you want to run, have at it, okay? But for most of us, we just want something that can be managed easily by the, by the UI, so we're just going to go to, through advanced mode right now. As soon as you hit next after advanced mode, you can say, okay, there's the specific hard drive, and it'll show you any partitions on that hard drive as well, and you can select the particular partition that you would like. PCBSD does require a primary partition. It does not work on logical partitions. So I know many Linux distros do use logical partitions, but no, PCBSD requires a primary partition. So when you need to set up your partitioning beforehand before you load into the installer, because it does not do any of the partitioning for you, okay? And then if you need to, you can partition the disk with GPT there as well. Um, next, select your file system. UFS has been the standard Unix file system that's been around for a good long time. However, if you're running a system that's 64-bit with more than two gigabytes of RAM, we highly recommend and we default to running the ZFS file system. This gives you all sorts of strengths and abilities for such as snapshotting and backups of your data, and allowing you to roll back and do tons of really, really cool features. So we highly recommend installing ZFS if your system is capable of it. Again, if you've got more than two gigabytes of RAM, and specifically if you're a 64-bit system, it starts to have a few issues on 32-bit systems. And then install bootable MBR. That is checked by default. If you are dual booting this with something else like Linux or Windows or you know, whatever other operating system you want, you probably want to uncheck that because the FreeBSD bootloader isn't as smart as a lot of the ones like Grub and EasyBCD and things like that for Windows. So I would recommend not installing the bootloader and then et simply editing Grub or whatever and adding an entry for PCBSD if you're going to uh, dual boot. So I highly recommend that stuff. So that's, that's an important one as well. You don't want to blow away your MVR if you don't need to. <laughs> and then the last screen is if you have ZFS, which I selected here, you can set up, for instance, Mirror and do software RAID if you have additional uh, uh, hard drives in your system, you can set up you know, however many and how you want to mirror them. Do I want to mirror it so that I have two of them so one of them can fail before I, you know, so I can put one in so I have one can fail safely? Or do I want to set it up with three drives so two can fail safely before I have issues? And things like that. So this lets you set up a lot of that stuff. And then, oh, there are, I forgot, there are a couple more things. Do you want to encrypt your hard drive? This uses FreeBSD's Jelly encryption layer. It goes on the entire drive or the entire partition, if you have it on a single partition, so that before it will even mount the partition or hard drive, it just on the prompt it says, oh, you need to provide your encryption password. And then it will unlock the drive, and then it will proceed to load the file system and load everything else on top of that. So it's on the block, it's block level encryption. You can or cannot do that, as you can see there. Um, if you go to the next screen, again, for ZFS, 
it lets you actually set some of the uh, special options for ZFS as well. For instance, do I want to encrypt particular data sets or particular categories? The FreeBSD ports tree, again, has over 23,000 applications. So you're not gonna be using it all the time. So if you have it on your system, it's kind of nice to compress it down so it takes up a lot less disk space, just because it's not there. But whenever you need it and go into it and just go into the directory, it'll automatically uncompress it for you for access. All right, so ZFS handles a lot of that very, very nicely. Okay, that's the end of the initial setup. Once you hit next, it'll drop you back down to the main screen. It says, I'm done, hit finish, hit continue to do it, and then you get a nice loading bar. I didn't make screenshots of that. You don't need to see more loading bars. Okay, so after that, it'll do the installation and say, all right, go ahead and hit finish to restart your computer and remove your drive after you restart your computer. So once that is done, it goes to phase two of the installation. All right, after you've restarted your computer and performed all the installation, this goes into what we call the post-installation but initial setup phase. This will only come up once and only the first time that you go boot into the system after an installation, okay? Again, just like before, what language do you want? That way everything is set up for you. Now, time zone. This lets you, um, if you install the system, give it to somebody who might go across the country, and then when they get there, they boot it up, and they can set their local time zone, okay? Root password, so basically your administrator password, root password, you're all familiar with that. And create a user, an initial user. Now, uh, PCBSD by default, the login managers do not let you log in as root. So you have to have an initial user and it has to be in the wheel group so that it can use root permissions and switch over to root as necessary. Okay? And that's all there is for the initial configuration. And as soon as you hit next, it loads you into your desktop. So welcome to PCBSD. This is the uh, LXDE desktop. This is what we default to on lower end systems, so uh, under two gigabytes of RAM, so this is LXDE, and there are notice there are just, just a couple icons on the desktop. One for the App Cafe, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but that's where if you wanna go get more software for your system without interfering with anything else in your system, that's where you go get it. So that's where you install web browsers because uh, some desktop environments don't come with a default web browser, so you might need to go get one first. Uh, that PCBSD control panel, that's where you wanna go to actually manage anything on your system. And then PCBSD, just like FreeBSD, has a handbook with a copy of it on your system right there. So if you ever have any questions about how to do something in PCBSD, we have a comprehensive handbook with a link right there on the desktop. So you can just open that up and look it up. We have tons of information in there. Yes? That is the symbol that LXDE decided to give to PDFs, apparently. So Adobe Reader is not installed by default. I believe um, LXDE has a program called ePDF View, I believe is what it's called, and that's what it will use for PDFs. Again, it's PCBSD desktop system agnostic, so whatever the desktop environment installs for the different formats is what you're gonna get with initially, unless you go into the App Cafe and install something else, okay? So let's go ahead and continue, and we'll go through uh, some of those things I just mentioned. Here's a view of the PCBSD control panel. Those of you that are familiar with KDE will say, hey, this looks very familiar. Yeah, it does. <laughs> PCBSD uses the Qt toolkit for all of its uh, graphical interfaces, and so does KDE. So a lot of the widgets will end up looking rather similar, even though we don't specifically intend for that. But this is the control panel. As you can see, there's links again for the App Cafe, Easy PBI, which I mentioned earlier, and we'll discuss some more, as well as things for like uh, setting up Active Directory or uh, setting up NVIDIA, because I have an NVIDIA card in the system, so I can get into the NVIDIA settings. Uh, setting up your firewall, there's the warden at the bottom, and Life Preserver, which I'll actually talk about here in just a moment. But first, let's go into the system configuration, the system manager on the control panel. This is where, during the installation, you know how I mentioned that you could install, if you hit the customize button, you could install any of the desktops or all the desktops that you wanted or configure your system any way you want. Going into the system manager presents you the exact same options. This is the exact same tree that you would see in the installer, and as you can see, you can select or unselect any of the desktops up above. There's tons of unsupported desktops, what we call unsupported, but they're really more advanced desktops where you might need to know some terminal. Not, not great for uh, new, computer users that aren't familiar with the command line. Not recommended, <laughs> okay? As well as some stuff like XBMC and uh, some additional drivers if you might need them for specific devices. 
some of the other utilities that we have here. Again, I mentioned these earlier, but I'll just run through them really quick. App Cafe, if you want to manage uh, end user applications, you go into the App Cafe, and that will use the PBI system, which I'll discuss in just a moment, and to install applications. This keeps it system independent so that you don't have to worry about touching anything or messing up your system just because you want to upgrade your, fire, your uh, web browser. And I'll go into that. Life Preserver, this is a utility that PCBSD includes to remotely back up all of your user data to some off-site server. The only requirements for that server is that it runs SSH and rsync. So this could be a free NAS box, this could be a Linux box, you know, any kind of server, as long as it runs SSH and rsync, you can set up Life Preserver to say, oh, I wanna store all of my data over there. And you can even tell it how frequently you wanna back up all your data. You can do it every day, you can do it every week, however you want. And if you go to a new system and you have your data, all backed up, you can open Life Preserver and say, okay, I'm here now on a completely new system. I wanna go to my server and I wanna pull all my data from that server and put it on this system too. And you can have it do that as well. So that's a, a utility that PCBSD provides specifically for backups, to, just to make it easy. But you don't have to set this up if you don't want to. It'll just sit there, okay? Um, mount tray, so FreeBSD is not Linux. We can't use a lot of the device mounting applications that are available in Linux. Because of that, we wrote our own application, which we quite uh, unimaginatively called the mount tray, for mounting external devices. And it just sits in the tray, and whenever you plug in a USB stick or whatever, it'll pop up a little notification saying, hey, I detected that something was plugged in. You click on that, you can click mount, and it'll automatically mount it for you and open it up in your file manager so that you can add, do whatever you want with it. Uh, system configuration, the network manager. As I mentioned, if you want to change your network configurations, wired or wireless, you would go into there and you could find all the common settings for that as well. And then there's also a sound configuration device. PCBSD will try to automatically set up your sound device to one of them. As it said on the thing, it's mine was PCM4, I believe it was. That isn't always right, so I always recommend going into that, especially right after an installation, just to make sure it is. There's a little button in there to test your sound as well. So you can just click on each device and hit test sound until you find the right one. Okay, let's go on. All right, now I've been leading up to this for a while, the PBI package system. This is kind of what I deal with quite a bit. So I want to go into this just a little bit longer. Basically, the purpose of the PBI package system was to provide a safe system package independent method of installing and updating applications. It also makes sure that applications do not require an internet connection for, for installation. We have a lot of people that use PCBSD go to, the, go to the library for internet, and so they just bring a USB stick, but they want to get applications as well. So this lets them simply download the application on some public computer somewhere, move that PBI file onto their USB stick, and then take it home. And once they're at home, then they can extract and install that application on their local computer without ever requiring an internet connection once they're on their main box. And then it also minimizes library duplication and preserved disk space. Uh, PBIs will share libraries among all of the PBIs. So, um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and continue. That was, those were the goals and the purpose. Let's go into some of the implementation. For PCBSD 9 and later, it was written in pure shell, not bash, it's, you know, bin slash sh. Um, this allows for simple compatibility and it lets it work on our server editions as well because it doesn't require any graphical toolkits or anything else. It just all it requires is the base sh that's included in FreeBSD. Um, it intelligently shares libraries between PBIs, as I said. It, it'll basically install copies of all of the files into what's called a hashder. It doesn't see any other ones, and then it manages and makes sure there's only one version of each of those libraries on disk. So any application that requires that particular version of that particular library will all share that library, because there's only one copy on disk. Um, a single PBI contains all the libraries, files, and data needed for an application to run. This means that a single PBI file will be larger than you expect on Linux. For instance, the Firefox PBI is about 100 megabytes. This surprises a lot of the people who come from Linux because they're saying, wait a minute, it should only be about 20 megabytes. Well, the reason for that is it includes all the dependencies, all the graphical toolkits, all the files, all, everything else that it needs is contained in that PBI. So it's a much larger install, uh, download initially but once you have a PBI installed, as soon as a new version is available, there is also Delta upgrades for that. So the update PBI, or .pbp, 
might be like two megabytes to upgrade to the next one. So the delta, there are delta upgrades once you have a PBI initially installed. So you only have to do that massive download once. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it is completely independent of the local system packages and other PBI applications. PBIs are a separate package. They go into a separate area on the hard drive. They do not mix with system packages or any other type of package that you have on the system. And they do not mix with the operating system itself as well. They are kept completely separately. So you can add, add them, remove them, upgrade them, all completely safely without touching anything else on your system. So you don't need to lose a weekend trying to fix your computer just because you wanted to update your web browser. Easy PBI, this is a graphical utility generate to use for generating your own PBI packages if, for instance, one, your, some particular application that you really need is not available in our repo. Our repo has over 1,100 PBIs, so most stuff is in there, but you know, just in case there's that one thing you need. It's just a simple UI to go through and generate it, and PBIs require a set of build instructions before the actual build. Easy PBI lets you automatically generate those build instructions, and you can have that done in less than five minutes. The actual build time will vary depending on the speed of your computer and how much RAM you have and stuff like that, but that will go through and build the PBI in a clean environment on your system. All right, the warden, I mentioned this earlier, but again, we have a graphical interface for this as well. There's both command line versions implemented, again, in pure shell, and a graphical version specifically for PCBSD that lets you set up many of the different types of jails. PCBSD also lets you set up three types of jails in particular. One is the traditional FreeBSD jail that lets you install a FreeBSD command line server into the jail. That's what we call a traditional FreeBSD jails. The second one is a ports jail. This is a nice, clean, sandbox environment that's not quite as secure as a traditional jail because it's meant for you to be able to run applications in it from your host, host uh, OS, so it'll use the graphical system. So it's a great environment for if you're developing applications and you want to have a testing environment, basically, a development environment where you can do whatever you want in there. It won't mess up your host system, but you can still run it from your host system. And then finally, we have Linux jails as well. You can install particular Linux is into the jail. Right now we have scripts to install, I believe it's Gentoo and Debian is the second one. So those are CLI versions of Linux only, no graphics whatsoever. We're still working on a Linux port jail. There have been a lot of people asking for that and we'll see what we can do with that. Not, nothing, nothing guaranteed there. There's also the ability to export and import jails between systems. So once you get up, get a jail all set up that you want, you could export it and then import it on some headless box somewhere else if you want to once it's all set up. So this makes it very nice for manually setting up and interfacing with servers that you might manage elsewhere as well. And then coming soon, we have Package NG system. This is the next generation package management system for FreeBSD. It is, has been developed and is continually being developed, and PCBSD has jumped on the bandwagon a bit early and is providing a whole lot of the testing and additional um, development testing of Package NG. We're in constant contact with the um, developer of the Package NG system. So this will allow you to, instead of building from ports, which is building from source all the time, to actually let you download and install binary packages, similar, a bit similar to apt, if you're familiar with that in Linux, and some of the other package managers in Linux. FreeBSD's just finally getting there with uh, binary packages for all that stuff. However, with that, PCBSD has also added a full graphical package manager as well. So in addition to the meta packages that I referred to earlier that we had earlier just for desktop environments and stuff like that, if you go into the advanced mode, you can actually do each individual package piece by piece if you would like to. So it gives you that full capability using the package system. And then we still do have in the basic mode those meta packages available for, again, safe system configuration if you're, for instance, my wife who just wants to switch to a different desktop because she doesn't like how KDE keeps breaking on her, you know, that kind of thing, if that happens, happens to happen. So it, you still have that safe mode as well as the advanced mode. Plus, PCBSD is just moving to a rolling release distribution framework. This means that 
our packages that we provide are going to be updated pretty much every two weeks, I believe, is the plan. So you could get update notifications whenever you have new packages available for what's installed on your system every two weeks, and you can keep up with that, as well as keeping up with new versions of any of the PCBSD utilities and tools. You'll be prompted when those are available as well. Um, plus, once that is all set up, we're also planning on creating a tracking FreeBSD stable. There, if you don't know, there's a few different tracks of FreeBSD. There's FreeBSD release, which is 9.1 currently, which is why PCBSD is 9.1. FreeBSD stable starts working on not quite 9.1, but not quite you know, the next one, 9.2, but helps you to get in there and get some of the additional FreeBSD improvements before they've officially been released in FreeBSD. This is useful for if you need some additional drivers or things like that that the older versions of FreeBSD just don't work quite right for. All right, well that's, again, the general overview of PCBSD. It's very, very, very low level, so do you have any questions about it? This is where the strength of it comes in. Just showing you the basics. Do you have any questions about PCBSD? Yes, sir. Yes, FreeBSD by default includes a compiler in the actual operating system itself. So not even if you don't have any packages on, on the system at all, the, free, the operating system itself has a default compiler in it. It has been GCC, but with the newer versions, it is switching over to Clang, which is LLVM, I believe. GCC is still more straight. Yes. Yes, as he mentioned, GCC and many other compilers are available in ports, they're just not included in the base operating system after a little bit. I believe a version of right now with 9.1, both GCC and Clang are actually built into the main OS, but they're gonna be dropping support for GCC in the main OS with future versions. Yes? The, the question was about Haskell support in FreeBSD, and yes, there is ports available for that as well. So you can get the Haskell compiler, you just need to install the package or go to ports and compile it yourself. Yes? Java development environment. We do have some Java support in FreeBSD, specifically in the form of OpenJDK. All right, we have OpenJDK version six and version seven, and this pulls from and uses Java versions six and seven, respectively, but the official Java uh, application, we do not have the latest versions. We have an older, outdated version of that, of the Diablo JDK. Yeah. Any other questions? How about wine? Okay, questions about wine. Yes, we do have port for Wine. It is a 32-bit only port though, which again, I believe is because the application itself is only designed to be 32-bit. For PCBSD, we actually have PBIs available for Wine and a special one called Wine 64. So if you're running a 64-bit system and you still wanna use Wine, even though it's 32-bit, if you install the Wine 64 PBI, it will install both Wine as well as a bunch of the 32-bit compatibility stuff to make sure that it runs perfect on a 64-bit system as well. Yes. Yeah. The question was, in general, is FreeBSD more general, uh, more stable than Linux? And I, I have heard it said so. Yes. Yes. I believe we actually had somebody at the corporate office that was running his computer for a couple of hundred days uh, and never had to shut it down. He was a little upset because one day he had to shut it down for some reason to restart it. Yes. I'm not saying everyone didn't have a decorated yes. experience, but you know, yeah. Yes, many FreeBSD users hate having to reboot their computer. So one of the stability aspects of FreeBSD is just seeing how long you can run it before you actually have to reboot the box. And I have heard cases of years going by before somebody had to reboot their box. 
So again, that's a your mileage may vary situation, but those are the kind of things we hear here and as to how stable it is. Any other questions? Yes. The question was, what do you have in the way of virtualization stuff? We do not have KVM at the moment. We do have VirtualBox, both in ports and in PBIs, and in PBI form. And I believe, do we have any other have major virtualization? We can run InZent as a client. We can run InZent? InZen. Oh, InZen. OK. Yes. So the BSD version hypervisor Beehive is coming, but it's not there yet. <laughs> All right, so stay tuned for that, and we'll see. Yes. How about VMware support? Um, yeah, you can do it as a client. All right, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for your attendance, and if you have any other further questions, we'll be around. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. 
These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra's. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. CloudStack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's 
some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the clouds tag. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked.